Well, if you can have that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 open, it will help us because we're going to go through it in quite a brisk manner this morning. Uh, But the title for our message this morning is this, Insights into Marriage, Divorce and Singleness. Insights. And they're not my insights, they are insights of an apostle. Now, if you look in verse 1, you'll read these words, now concerning matters about which you wrote. Paul is systematically answering questions sent to him in a letter from the church in Corinth. Paul is dealing with the fallout of the gospel. Now, what do I mean by the fallout of the gospel? Recently, the queen died. And I watched a programme and they said, when she dies, a whole protocol comes into place and we have to change all the coins. Eventually you'll see coins with pictures of Prince Charles on them. But when it comes to the letterboxes that have ER written on them in cast iron, they may be around for 25 years. It may take us 25 years to change all them. You see, when the Queen died, a momentous event took place didn't it a momentous event and because a momentous event took place there was all kinds of fallout from it when the gospel came to Corinth it was a momentous event the society was immoral people were encouraged in their culture to be involved in sexual prostitution in temples There was all kinds of immorality going on in the city. And into that city comes the gospel to all different kinds of people, Jew and Gentile. And some of them believe it. And some of them are radically changed. And some of them come to Christ. And now there's all kinds of fallout because of that momentous event for the church to deal with. What do I do now? I'm a Christian. And I'm married to someone who isn't a Christian who worships false gods. Do I walk out on them? I used to go to the temple. I'm a single person. A young person. I've always done this. And now I've become a Christian. Paul has written to them and said, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. And Paul's now writing and saying that any kind of sexual expression outside of marriage, imagine this concept, is wrong. What do we do? Imagine some of the questions that they had. What about two believers who were struggling in the faith? Did they stay together or should they just split up for a trivial thing? And so Paul addresses all these groups of people in a very helpful way. And we're going to consider his his advice. So if you're a widow this morning or a widower, Paul will address you. And if you're a single person, Paul's got some advice for you. If you're a married person or a divorced person, there's all kinds of things to help us. You see, the word of God shows us how to live. We need the word of God. So the structure of our sermon this morning is this. In verses 1 to 7, we're going to think about general principles of marriage general principles verses 1 to 7 and then in verses uh, 8 to 16 Paul is going to apply these principles to specific groups now you may not be married this morning but don't switch off because there's stuff for you Um, so let's work through it now concerning the matters about which you wrote so they'd asked a question we don't know what the question is because we don't have the letter even two of the letters that Paul wrote have been lost we only have two and four we call those one and two Corinthians but they're really two and four so we don't know what they asked maybe they asked is celibacy is celibacy a higher spiritual condition than marriage maybe they asked that question now Paul writes to them and in verse one he tells them it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman now he doesn't say keep away from immorality He says in this verse there's nothing wrong with singleness singleness is a legitimate position celibacy singleness is a legitimate position for a Christian who wants to live that life it's not odd to be unmarried 
the society can be very cruel to single people as look down on them as though something's gone wrong why have you not got married but Paul says no we're not to do that in the church singleness is a legitimate position but it isn't a superior position in the Catholic Church priests cannot marry they must be married entirely to God constantly throughout the New Testament the teaching about abstaining from marriage was brought in and Timothy had to deal with these issues as though this Gnostic idea now I'm a spiritual person I will keep completely away from those unclean things because I'm spiritual imagine if somebody was saved and they were say, uh, married to an unbeliever and they were saying these things in Corinth Paul says no marriage is good singleness is not any higher or any lower it's a legitimate position and it has benefits we're going to think about the practical benefits of singleness in a second now let's move on to verse 2 but because of the temptation to sexual immorality each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband so Paul has told us that any form and this is a very high um, level and standard any form of sexual expression outside of marriage is, is immorality that's the Christian teaching on sexual behaviour but marriage is the right place for these things and being single carries with it tremendous temptations look at verse 6 now as a concession not a command I say this I wish that all were I, as I myself am but each has his own gift from God one of one kind and one of the other now Paul was probably a widower he wouldn't have been able to vote in the Sanhedrin if he wasn't married so we probably believe that his wife has died that's the view I take and he's on his own and he's committed to gospel work but he's, he's, he's aware that singleness and being able to stay pure in a city like Corinth is a tremendous ask so if you haven't got that gift it's, it's a gift not everybody can do this if you cannot live a single life in celibacy and are constantly under the issues of sexual immorality or temptation then it's good to get married that's the advice of the scriptures but because of the temptation to sexual immorality each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband now some people say oh Paul has a very low view of marriage here is that all marriage is as a as a safeguard against lost no it's not he's addressing here a specific problem of immorality in the church he's not giving a comprehensive treaty on the subject of marriage he's making a plain and simple blunt fact that marriage is the place that God has given for right sexual behavior so where a celibacy is good and uh, it is a gift um, celibacy does not have place in a marriage the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband for the wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband does likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does now it's interesting isn't it that Paul is not prudish about these things he's writing about these things to a church in a letter in a public letter but he doesn't go into graphic details and apply all these things he brings the concept to the marriage situation this is the rightful place for these things they're natural for a husband and wife and they are personal to each marriage they have to be worked out between the two individuals look at the picture in verse 4 now I'm sure these uh, verses have probably been abused by men in Christian marriages uh, uh, who've made all kinds of demands and the, the picture here is not of headship the picture here on this occasion is of partnership if you look at the level of power it is equal the wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband does likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does it's about consensual partnership it's about working together it's about self-giving to one another 
Now, uh, you'll know in my sermons that I use a couple of quotes. I was always to told not to use too many, use them sparingly. So I, I aim for about two. You're probably not surprised that on this particular verse I'm running to a quote, but there I am. Um, the emphasis in marriage is not to be on performing one's duties to one's partner, it is, is to be on performing one's duties to one's partner rather than demanding one's rights. In a fallen world, we tend to major on our rights and therefore within marriage, our marital rights. This special perspective the Christian faith gives to human relationships is that it teaches us to emphasize rather our duties. The secret of a successful marriage is not to insist upon what our partner owes us, but to focus on what our duty is to our marriage partner. That approach makes a world of difference and pr promotes harmony instead of discord. When either partner in a marriage asks, what are my rights, seeds of discontent are sown. On the other hand, when instead the question is, what are my duties, a good foundation is built and strengthened. A clear marital duty is to safeguard and maintain the sexual relationship within a marriage something to be achieved by mutual consent. As the years pass by in a marriage, the pattern of life and the sexual needs of a couple may vary and sometimes be different, but they need to be sensitive to each other's needs and comforts. Well, I'm not going to say any more on that subject. There's the picture, consensual partnership. This is the place, rightful place for those things. They're not wrong in that context. It's very different from the city of Corinth but there are responsibilities in the marriage and Paul reminds them of those things. So we thought about uh, celibacy, we thought about singleness, that it's a gift, we've thought about uh, marriage and its responsibilities with its broad principles in these ways. Let's come to the specific applications in verses eight to 16. So look at verse eight. Paul is going to address single people, people who are unmarried. Then he's going to address people who are married, who are Christians, in verse 10. And then in verses 12 to 16, he's going to address people who are married to unbelievers. So we've got single people, we've got married people who are Christians, and then we've got people in 12 to 16 who are married to unbelievers. And I bet people are quite uh, interested to see what I'm going to say about verse 14. I bet there's a few people wondering about that particular verse. So let's take verse 8. <clears throat> to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, Paul says earlier, uh, sorry, later on in the passage, this thing about the practical position of being single. In verse 32 of chapter 7, he says this. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. There are practical benefits of being single. Imagine Paul's missionary journeys. Let down a wall in a basket. On several occasions, his citizenship saved his life. On several occasions, he was run out of the town. On several occasions, he was stoned. Imagine if he was married. How could he do that work at that time? How could he go off for two years with no GPS and phones, satellites, no furlough? The missionary work of the early church was demanding and dangerous. And if you took a, a family along, you'd have all kinds of needs that you'd have to bring upon the hosts. When Paul went to a place, he didn't even take money. He used to bring his tent making job and support himself. And he didn't make demands on the church. He could be put up easily, probably, in a room or a spare room with just minimal food. Imagine the, the difficulties of families involved in that missionary work at that time. Now, today, it's very different. We have missionaries who come back and 
uh, go on holiday for six months and they have all kinds of facilities for their families and everything else. But the point that Paul is making is why does he keep coming back to being it's good to be single when he said marriage is good? Is there are practical benefits of being single. Imagine if you're a young person today. You don't have to get home for a particular time to be sat at the table with your family or you're going to be away for a few weeks. Think of how you can serve the Lord without restraint. Go on beach missions or help in this particular area or put your energy into this particular area in a way that a married person can't do. So often people use that freedom just for leisure. I'll go off around the world or do this or be involved in this backpacking expedition. But being single, says Paul, has benefits, practical benefits, if you have the gift of singleness. But if you haven't, then you should marry because it's better to, to marry than to burn with passion or to fall into sexual immorality. And then what about the married people in verse 10? To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife. Now remember that Paul is not giving a detailed exposition, and I'm not this morning, on all the cases of marriage and remarriage and divorce. But imagine in Corinth there were those people who'd come together, the church was in its infancy, there were two people who were now believers, they'd be very new believers, no completed scriptures, maybe they were a, a couple going through a rocky time in a marriage, maybe they'd fallen out over an argument or trivial matter. And Paul says the charge, the command I have to people who are Christians who are married, is not to separate. Now he says that this command is not from him, it's from the Lord, not I but the Lord. What does he mean? He has in view here Jesus' teaching that I read at the start of, of the service. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So he says to them, if you separate on a trivial matter, then you should try and come back together, try and save the marriage. Always try and save the marriage. Or if uh, somebody wants to divorce the wife just on a trivial, don't divorce the wife. That's the message I have to the, to the Christians who are married. Now he doesn't bring in the other words that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, it was also says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What does uh, Jesus say? If one of those partners in the marriage went off and united themselves to somebody else, then there would be grounds for marriage and remarriage, sorry, divorce and remarriage. But Paul doesn't address that issue. The charge he's bringing here is a charge of stay together. Keep the marriage going, whatever you do, if you're a Christian. Now let us move on to the next group of people in verses 12 to 16. So we have an unbelieving person who agrees to stay with the Christian. An unbeliever and a Christian married together, now the gospel has come. There's all kinds of fallout from the gospel. And then at the end of the verses, we have a married uh, couple where one is a Christian and one is an unbeliever, and the unbeliever doesn't want to stay. They're going to go. They're not going to stay with this individual. So there's two groups of people. To the rest I say, verse 12, I, not the Lord. Why does he say that? because the Lord never gave any specific teaching on this. So Paul, as an authoritative apostle, is dealing with this subject. He's speaking now the very words of Christ. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that any brother who has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with him, with her, she should not divorce him. And then he gives the reason why. Now what did some of these people think? They were probably going back to the Old Testament uh, where you became unclean by defilement. If you touched a dead body, you became ceremonially unclean. So here is a house. 
It was once a house of people who worshipped false gods and were unsaved. And the gospel comes to the life of one of those individuals. Now that individual is sharing a house and children with an unbeliever. Surely we must leave. Surely we must get out in case we all get defiled by them and they contaminate us with their false gods and their false ideas. And Paul says, no, it's the opposite principle. You're not going to get contaminated by them. The gospel will have an influence or may have an influence on them. So you must stay in the marriage if they want to stay with you. Now let's just look at verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Well, these are some of the most difficult verses in the New Testament. And people have said they're about infant baptism or uh, covenant theology, and there's nothing to do with infant baptism. It's nothing to do with covenant theology. What is the argument that Paul is making why the person should stay with the unbeliever? Because the unbeliever's family is set apart because of the believer's presence in the family. Now, let me explain it. Here is a street. It's a made-up street. In house A live a family where none of them believe the gospel. What is their status and position before God? The wrath of God is against them. They will face eternal punishment. They want nothing to do with God. There is no gospel light in that house. No gospel influence. That house is not set apart in any way. The wrath of God is against that family. It is an ungodly family. Now the word here, made holy in our translation, isn't particularly helpful. So... In the New King James, it translates it like this. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Sanctification, sanctified, we use that term in regards to salvation. But it's not talking about salvation. It's not saying the children are saved, or the unbelieving person is saved by the person. The sanctification in mind here is the word set apart. So when something was used in the temple and it was a vessel, maybe a, I don't know, a candlestick, once it was common, but now it's set apart for holy things. It doesn't mean that the person is saved because the unbeliever is in the family or the children are saved. What it means is that there is a sense in which they're set apart. So here's family A, nobody is a believer. Now what about family, family B in the street? There were two believers living in a house and they had two sons. And both of the sons in their teenage years came to faith in Christ at a Christian camp. Now the family is completely united. Every person in that house is married to Christ. Every single person in that house has gospel light and has passed from light into uh, into darkness into light. Every person in that house knows the acceptance of God. That house is completely set apart. Now what about house C? In that house is an unbelieving person and a believing person and their children. They were married and one of them went to a Christian meeting and became a Christian. The status of that marriage is changed. There is a person in that house who is set apart to God. There is a person in that house with gospel influence. There is a person in that house that's praying for that family. That house has an altogether different status because that believing person is there, because they have even the very church of Christ, because they are present. So it's a setting apart because of the influence of the believer on the family. The ho- a family that was once in complete darkness now has access to light, and the children come into the influence of that light because of the believer so Paul is saying don't leave your unbelieving family because you may bring light into it pray for them stay with them if they will stay with you they are set apart in a sense to the influence of the gospel in a way that non-christian families 
are not, where nobody's a Christian at all. That marriage, if you're married to an unbeliever, is not any less than a Christian marriage where two are Christians. It's a legitimate marriage. God is with you in it. Stay with it. You won't get defiled because of them. It must have been difficult with all the things that the unbelievers were doing in Corinth. But Paul says, let the gospel have influence in that family. Well, we come to verse 15 now. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you'll save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So we come to the last category that Paul's going to address. And this is the case where a person becomes a Christian. And I have personal experience of this and people I have known. They become a Christian and the other person has had enough. They want to go. That's it. I'm not going to stick with this. The person has tried to reconcile the marriage. They've tried to deal with the problems. But the other person is determined. I am breaking off this marriage and I am going. Paul says, in that case, you're not under bondage. If the person wants to go, then you've done everything you can then you are no longer under bondage. This has been called in Christian theology theology, the Pauline privilege. And there'll be some Christians who accept the Pauline privilege and there are some Christians who don't accept the Pauline privilege. Now I'd like to just make some observations on this because we can't cover this morning, I'm sure you can see, marriage and remarriage and divorce in all its... uh, shades and and problems it's a very sensitive subject people's lives are uh, in people's hands and we have to be very very sensitive about it it's not just a case of uh, you know arguing doctrines but let me just make a couple of observations now i have a book before me in front of me the reformed confessions harmonized i have in front of me in this book all the different reformed confessions the Heidelberg Catechism, the Second Helvetic Catechism, Westminster Confession, 1647, the larger Westminster... And I can see them all laid out on all different subjects. Now let me quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1647. God, um, it is apt to study arguments on Julie to put asunder those whom God has joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion can no way be remedied by the church which can be no way remedied by the church is sufficient cause of dissolving the bond of marriage so the Pauline privilege is recognised in the confessions of faith it's recognised in the Westminster confession of faith that if an unbeliever deserts the the believer uh, the marriage bond is can be dissolved now I did a bit of uh, research and I took some of the books that I, I had at home the John MacArthur Study Bible, various commentaries, the Banner of Truth commentary, and all of them recognised the Pauline privilege. They all recognised that it was a legitimate grounds for divorce and remarriage. There are some Christians who say, no, you can uh, dissolve the marriage bond but not remarry. I'm not going to discuss that this morning. But let me just quote from John MacArthur on this subject. And I'll come to those who don't believe in this in a second. Let him depart, uh, chapter 7, verse 15, a term referring to divorce. When an unbelieving spouse cannot tolerate the partner's faith and wants a divorce, it is best to let that happen in order to preserve peace in the family. The bond of marriage is broken only by death, Romans chapter 7, verse 2, adultery, Matthew chapter 19, and verse 9, and the unbelievers leaving. They're not under bondage. When the marriage is broken in any of these ways, a Christian is free to marry another believer. Throughout scripture, whenever a legitimate divorce occurs, remarriage is assumed. When divorce is permitted, so is remarriage. By implication, the permission for the widow to remarry because the bond is broken extends to this case where there is no more bondage. So John MacArthur, I'd say he's pretty typical, recognises the Pauline privilege of uh, uh, willful desertion and remarriage. Now, let me make a couple of observations in closing. I am divorced. And it is a very, very difficult thing to be a Christian. There's a stigma that comes with it. 
And I was a member of a Brethren church, and it was on the right wing of the Brethren. And they believed, not in the Pauline privilege, or in uh, the case of, that Jesus mentions, because they come from a very dispensational background, there are some Christians that believe there are never any causes for divorce and remarriage. And they take Jesus' words and interpret them in a particular way, and they hold a very hard line. The Catholic Church has a similar view of marriage. There's always been people beyond the confessions of faith that have held an unorthodox, dogmatic, hard line. Now, I cannot understand what Jesus means in Matthew chapter 5 if it doesn't mean that the marriage bond can be dissolved on the grounds of adultery. Then there are other people within reform circles who believe that marriages can be dissolved because of adultery, but not the Pauline privilege. Now, let me just make some observations. If you hold a very hard dogmatic position, you have to be consistent with it. Here's the brethren position, no divorce. And a young family comes to the assembly and they come into the gospel meeting and they're saved. They're saved, they're, they're tremendously saved and they, they come for membership at the, at the assembly. And when they sit down to do the interview, the man says, when I was 19, I was an unbeliever, I was married but I got divorced. Now we met each other and we've got a lovely family and uh, we're together and we've become Christians. By their position, they can't come into fellowship because they're in a state of adultery, because they've remarried. What do you do? Do you rip the family apart? Do you take the children to be uh, brought up by someone else or by one of them? How do you bring them into the assembly if you hold that position? Nobody can come in, and so you find that people go not only dogmatic and beyond the confessions, but they come up with their own ideas. Well, if they did it before they were a believer, we can't really hold them accountable. It doesn't say that in the Bible. So they have all these modified positions to try and fit this very dogmatic position in. What about if you hold to the position that there's no such Pauline privilege, so willful desertion is not legitimate, only sexual immorality. Uh, and when I faced a divorce, somebody came round to my house, not anybody here, to talk to me and to counsel me. And uh, they were a friend of mine, they were trying to help and they'd worked all this out by reading a couple of books uh, in, in like a kind of equation. Well, if you do this, there's that, and if you do that, there's this, and if you do that, there's it. So I posed them a couple of questions, and they had no answers for it. Here is a family, and one of them becomes a believer, um, and one of them's unsaved, and the unsaved person has had enough, and they're going. So they start a relationship with somebody in the village down the road. When it comes to a divorce, there's all kinds of difficulties like um, getting a ground up, uh, divorce on the grounds of adultery is very complicated so most divorces happen on the grounds of unreasonable behaviour so they're not going to come out with all this information about what they've been doing and what they've been up to so the, the believer doesn't know he thinks the marriage is just a case of desertion they said, they've said to him they've had enough and they're walking out then that person goes to live on the south coast of England and while they're there, they're not a believer, they start all kinds of relationships, they keep it all secret. What does that person do? Do they troll their Facebook page trying to find information out if they've had a, a sexual encounter so they can move on with their life? Do they try and hire a private detective that they might find out if they've been up to something? Because as soon as they find that out, then they've got grounds with their church for divorce. So you see, the reason I raise these things is not to be controversial, is if you are very dogmatic on a position, you have to carry it through when people's lives are at stake and they're very sensitive issues and there are all kinds of complexities with this. So the Reform Confession recognises the Pauline privilege. The scriptures are very clear, I think, on the subject of uh, uh, adultery, that there are certain grounds, although they are not easy and light for remarriage and divorce, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what's right or what you should believe or what the position of the church is. I've only raised those issues as Paul does. But pray for those who have to deal with those things. If you uh, find somebody who's facing a divorce and the church is trying to deal with it, pray for the elders because they're very complicated issues and nothing is rarely straightforward. 
Pray for those who are being divorced. Some of them didn't want to be in that position and it carries with it a stigma. Um, pray for them. But then Paul concludes today's teaching with verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And this is my rule in all the churches. What will you do with your life? What has God called you to do? Has he called you to be married? Well, be the best husband or the best wife that you can be. Be faithful and considerate. Be, pray to be better. You can ask Ramona, I'm trying to be better. You know, you can ask her all about me, but I, every day I pray that I'm better. Try and be the best husband. Try and use your marriage. There's great uh, opportunities when you're married for hospitality and things. Uh, I, I look back on when I tried to have people around at the house when I was on my own. I was all over the place. You know? But it was, it's great to have Ramona there and she's helping with those things. It's much, it's much, there's certain privileges. But if you're a single person and you're happy with that, nobody should be looking down upon you or looking at you as any way inferior. You've got great opportunities and responsibilities to use your singleness in a way that married people can't. Um, so the Lord will bless you in those things. Pray for single people who want to be married. Pray for people uh, to find somebody who would be a good Christian partner for them. There are some people who find themselves in this situation by providence, not by choice. And the church must help them. They must support them in finding a partner. And we should pray very much for our single people that they wouldn't fall into those particular temptations that singleness has do you pray for them do you remember the single people in the congregation in your prayers uh, it should be a priority for us all Paul doesn't command you to do anything or to take any particular position but use the position you've got to the glory of God and to his name now what have we learned today in our, in our teaching we've learned this should we scorn singleness is sex outside of marriage wrong? Can a widow or a widower remarry? In what circumstances should we keep a marriage alive? And in what circumstances should we let it die? Is there a difference between separation and divorce? What grounds are there in the Bible for divorce and remarriage? We've touched on all these subjects and hopefully the teaching of God's word will help us counsel others and understand these things better. We pray that God would bless these things as we go through them in our uh, studies together.